Hey everybody, time for another using Emacs video. And well, it's not really gonna be using Emacs because you know, today is the day. Today, um, it's my turn to do my using Emacs rant, Emacs versus Vim. All right, so it's been long coming. We're gonna do the showdown. Okay, well, not really. Um, so actually, why am I doing this, this rant or this video now? Well, um, there've been a bunch of posts that um, I've been seeing over the last few weeks that, that, that kind of irked me a little bit. Uh, people are like, I'm new to Emacs. What should I do? And that's great. And, or should I switch to Vim? Should I use the regular key mind? And these are all great questions, but what irks me are sometimes the answers. And, um, you know, the type of answer that gets me is, you've got to do this. It's like, oh, well, you've got to use, uh, you've got to use Space Max and the Vim bindings because they're just 100% better all the time. They're faster, they're more efficient, they're more well thought out. Um, or it's like, don't bother with the, the Vim ones, use the Emacs ones, uh, you know, but these, these absolutes. And, um, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm glad that I'm seeing more and more people who are kind of, um, you know, reasonable and pragmatic about it. I just saw a video um, the other day that, uh, you know, the other week about it. And um, I think Derek, I forget his last name, posted it. I'll link to it in the blog post, which was a very well measured, um, you know, Vim Emacs uh, video. And I saw that after I had already planned this and part of me was like, well, he's got it covered. Um, but I think I'm gonna be able to add a little context here because, um, um, I've been doing this, I've been in this game for a long time. I'm 52 and a half years old. Um, I've been programming since the early 80s, maybe late 70s. I mean, that's when I was a kid. Uh, but my first exposure was in, um, you know, when I was in uh, middle school or junior high, as we called it. Um, and um, it did more programming in high school. Uh, and um, I've been using Emacs uh, since uh, my first exposure to Emacs was while I was a senior in high school. And um, so that was 1984 in the spring of 84. And I've been using it on and off and then totally on ever since. But I'll talk about that. So I want to talk a little bit about some of my perceptions about this Emacs VI thing. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the history of it, a little bit of, um, you know, why these, uh, why, you know, things aren't aren't what they seem in terms of, you know, this is better, this is worse. And, and um, you know, and then in the end of the day, some recommendations. Um, you know, so so why don't we start, let me give you a little bit about my editing history. So um, my first exposure to Emacs was actually on a slow modem. So it was really painful and I didn't do it much, um, but it was more to see what I could do. I got access to a um, a TOPS 20 system at a university. And um, so I connected to it via a 300 board modem and a 300 board modem you would kind of get characters would go across the screen at like this rate um, you know maybe I'm a little bit off here but something like this uh, so it was painful uh, so that didn't last very long um, then in college I started using Emacs um, on the time sharing systems because I knew of it from from my from when I was in high school and um, so I would use it on the TOPS 20 systems at NYU and on the VAXs and on the Unix machines when I started using those. Um, on the PC, because this was part of the PC generation, uh, I was using things like, uh, for word processing, I was using WordStar for the most part. Um, and that had a crazy interface, which was like uh, Control KB was bold and Control KQ was quit um, and Turbo Pascal, which use the same type of IDE interface. Um, for editing, I eventually uh, settled on um, Epsilon, which was an Emacs alike uh, that ran under DOS. And then later on, I moved to Micro Emacs. And then when Linux came around, I became Emacs all the time. Um, but but in the meantime, you know, a lot of my friends and classmates later on in college used Brief. Brief was like the hot, Brief was like sublime text before sublime text. Um, and that shaped some of my views on editors, like uh, why I don't like using a non-open source editor, because invariably, um, you know, they eventually go away and then all of your customizations and plugins and whatever, you know, are, are lost to history. Um, so every few years, I also, um, I also learned VI. And um, every few years I would kind of dive into VI, see if I liked it and see if it was for me. And I've always come back to Emacs, um, but, uh, but that's kind of my history. And so the first thing I'd like to look at here is let's look at beginners. Cause I'm kind of tired, like I, I, I hear these ridiculous statements like Emacs is hard to learn, or on the other hand, I'll hear even more ridiculous statements like 
Vim is so much easier to start with. Um, so, so let's actually take a look. So if I start Emacs, if I just, um, if I go Emacs-Q, um, so it doesn't load up my, uh, my config, this is what it looks like. And, um, you know, a little bit small there, but it brings me here. I can see that it gets me a tutorial. I can click with the mouse if I want. Um, I don't know how to get out of it until I read the tutorial. I mean, I know how to get out of it, but um, if I'm a beginner, I don't. I could view the manual, so I can do mouse things from that. Once I'm in the tutorial, I can use it. I can use the menu, so I can open a file like... Uh, who knows what file I have here. Um, I think I have something... I put so oh yeah, I put something in the in the temp directory. I know this is this is really painful. Um, you know, so I can uh, you know I can load a file, I can edit it. You know, it's nothing fancy, but I haven't learned anything. But I'm using it. Um, you know, that's that's as easy as you get. I mean, it may look kind of ugly. Let me see if I can. Let me remove my whole atom config, and let me load atom. And this wasn't meant to be an Atom thing, but if I load up Atom, it's not radically different. I can open a project. I don't know what that is. You know, I, um, it, I, I've got a menu. I've got these. I can go file, open. Not radically different. Um, on the other hand, if I do Vim, um, again, not radically different, but the only difference here is it is modal. So I have to... Ah, where am I? Oh, there's nowhere to go because that, you know, I'm not, unlike Emacs where it's the buffer, um, I have nothing in here. So I can type colon help and that will tell me how to get into this. And then I can read this. I can use my HKJ. And now, now I can move around. I can read this whole thing. So not horrible. Um, I think it's a little bit trickier because I have to know I can quit and then quit again. And I guess the help, I guess it says it somewhere in there. Um, but these are not radically different. Um, you might say that Emacs or Vim are uglier than the, you know, than the more polished products. Um, but they are, you know, if anything, I'd say Vim is a little bit harder to get into uh, because it's modal, because you have those different modes. Um, but they're all manageable. I mean, I learned VI back in the day. Um, I learned Emacs back in the day, and most people can as well. So, so let's just stop. Can we as a community stop with the Emacs is hard for beginners? Um, Emacs is hard if you jump into a complex config, um, but so is anything else. You know, so is um, you know, so is Vim. You know, like if you're dealing with someone else's config that you don't understand. But if you're just getting into these. There isn't really a huge learning curve for most editors. Um, Vim has the modal thing going, but but I don't think that's a total killer if you're prompted, you know, if you're prepped for it. If someone says, hey, look, it's got this modal thing, so go to the tutorial, go through it, it'll tell you all about it. Um, so that's the first thing that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the next I want to talk about is... Um, a little bit, I, I want to debunk a little bit of this idea that, you know, what I hear sometimes is, you know, Emacs was designed horribly, there's no sense at all to the key bindings, but Vim was developed brilliantly and it is so great ergonomically and all of that stuff. Um, because, you know, Emacs does have, there was a sensibility behind the design, um, but it's got problems and it's got good points. And there was a reason behind Vim's design, but it's also a historic reason. And there's some good to it and there's some bad to it. So, so I wanted to talk about that a little bit. So let's look at the roots of these. So Emacs started from, um, grew out of Tico and its editor macros for Tico. And Tico was a line editing environment. And Vim came out of X, which was also a line editor. So a way a line editor works, a line editor would let you edit files if your interface was only a line at a time. So this was for like teletype terminals. You have a terminal which was like a big printer typewritery thing and you type a line and it would go out on the paper, you'd hit enter and then it would send it to you know the computer, the computer would send back the response and then that would print out. And you just have a continuous feed of paper with your interactions, you know, kind of like a Python REPL or a Clojure REPL, um, you know, or a shell, you know, where you'd have like, I would type something, you know, I would type LS, enter, 
and then that would be printed, but it was on a printer. Um, it would also be for slow connections at the you know, earlier, um, but this was a step up certainly from punch cards, uh, which I also worked with at my high school. We had an IBM 1130, and so I cut my teeth on punch cards as well. But, um, but as a line editor, what you do is you type commands and you edit on this final line at a time, and um, it's how you had to do things. So I actually downloaded the source code for Tico and built it, and here it is, and there are these files in here. So let, let's run Tico. So I, this, this took me a while to figure out. I can run, it's Tico C, I'll run Tico on the file. Re, actually, before that, let's read me LNX. This is what the file looks like that I'm going to edit. So it's gonna be Tico C, Tico, read me dot LNX. So this would be the line that comes out of my printer, and I would type something, or this would be my screen and I would type something. So I could type something like maybe I want to view a line and then I hit the escape key twice, which activates the command and that's the first line. Or I could say I want to view five lines and it does that. And I'm currently on line one, so maybe I want to move four lines down and I can look at that line and that's the fourth line, I move four lines down. Or maybe I want to go one line up, I think, oh no, minus one L, whoops, escape, escape, and that moved me a line above that. So I can move in my file up and down that way. So let's say I want to go change mode to, I don't know, um, something else. I can go, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, oh, like 13. So let's move 13 characters in and let's insert abode instead of mode and let's now view the line and so I insert well it inserted abode at that location as you can see and so I'm just interacting a line at a time um, and so I could you know, like I don't know um, And I, I don't really know how to use this that much. And then there's a way of writing it, etc. cetera. And um, Emacs stands for editor macros. And so the idea, you have these very simple commands, but you could put them into a file using this, these primitives, and then you could run these commands in here as macros. You could run the commands in the files as a macro, and that would extend its power. And then Emacs came out of that. Now, other historic features of Emacs include like, oh, well, what about the control N and the control P and stuff like that? Control N for next, control P for previous, and control forward and back. Well, the keyboard didn't have, um, you know, it, it didn't have arrows on it. And so they had to come up with, you know, what keys are we going to use? And so N, P, next, previous, forward, back. Um, and then things grew out of that. So like control F for forward, for forward character, alt F would be forward a word. So there's a certain sensibility to this, um, as we'll talk about later on, but it's all rooted in this history. Now, the I was also rooted in its history. And so for VI, I also, um, VI grew out of the editors Ed and X. Ed was the Unix line editor, which was very primitive, and X added on to that. And Bill Joy added um, uh, VI onto X, and X, the way X worked, is I could type X, and then um, I, I, now I'm, I'm in X, and you'll notice there it says type visual to go to normal mode, and I'll talk about that later, but in X or in Ed, I can insert lines, so I can type line one, line two, line three, line four, and line five, and I enter a dot enter, and that finishes this off, and I can say one to five list, list my lines. Um, and I can do various things with this, like I can say on lines two to three, um, search for line and change it with fine. And so two to three non-includes, or two to two I wrote, I should have wrote two to three, but notice line becomes fine. So I can do my replace and then I can save my file, etc. Now, this was X 
And what, the, um, what it also allowed you to do, it was very simple, but it could leverage Unix, which was really cool. So this was different. I, I mean, I don't really know Tico. I couldn't figure out that much of it. But since I did learn um, a little X and you know, VI over the, over the years, um, it follows the Unix philosophy. So it doesn't do a whole lot. It had these very primitive features, but what you could do is you could leverage the shell. So let's say I wanted to sort these lines alphabetically. I could say one through five, let's pipe that through sort. And then if I say one through five list, fine, line, 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 but the, you know, now it is sorted. Or if I wanted to say send lines two through three through the translate command to translate lowercase through uppercase, I can use that. So I'm leveraging the shell. And this was what X was. Now what VI was, now remember, this is a line editor on a teletype or on a very slow terminal connection. So what you've got is, um, so, so now with VI, it's like, well, we want to make this a little bit better on our terminals. It's a visual mode. So it added this visual feature. So it's really not a full screen editor, but a visual mode for a line editor. And that's where this whole modal thing comes from. And then the way these keys come from, yeah, where's my, okay. The keys come from the fact that on Bill Joy's keyboard, the arrows weren't H, J, K, and L. And so it's not that it's better or more intuitive. It's that's where the arrows were. Um, and that's great, but I'm left-handed, so I probably would have preferred A, S, D, F, or you know, the A, W, S, D cluster or something like that. Um, but that's where it's from. It's all from history. Um, it's not this, you know, oh, let's come up, well, oh, well, I know, modal will be better. Um, and, you know, people are talking about this modal is inherently better because, you know, like on the one hand, you'll hear people say like, oh, it's much faster. I can be blazingly fast and I can do all this stuff. Um, but then they all say, oh, most of the time you're not actually typing. So it's better to have the mode. It, you can't have both. The truth is, and um, we'll get to some examples of this later in the video. The truth of the matter is, um, if you're typing prose, and I'm also going to bring up an Emacs window that I can put into frame here. Um, make it a little smaller. Just uh, I'm, on a, I'm on my 4K monitor that I've been using these days for my videos. And the problem is that I'm only recording with OBS on a portion of the screen and I'm not used to, you know, I got to get the size to come down to it on this little corner. Um, so anyway, um, you know, if I'm just typing like, you know, four score and seven years, yeah, years ago, you know, you're just typing, you're in flow. And so if you're in the flow, you actually, you know, all you're going to do is like, oh, I have a typo. Let me go up for the typo or, you know, fix my typo like that. But you can't actually do that easily in VI. And we'll look at that later. Um, but you're just typing. And so as long as you're typing and you're typing correctly, you're not doing fancy editing features. And... Um, then when you're editing code, yes, you're moving things around and there's a difference in the philosophy between VI and Emacs. We'll talk about that. Neither, I don't think either is inherently better. You know, maybe one will be a couple of keystrokes faster and a couple of keystrokes slower. But the truth is the majority of the time you're thinking. You're not writing, you're not moving and cutting and pasting and rearranging, you're thinking. And so really, is the bit difference that big of a deal? Um, you know, I mean, I get it if, you know, like, like if there are, you know, if one editor speaks to you or not, or if you're like, I've never had a problem with Emacs or Emacs Pinky or any of that, but you know, I get it. If that's a problem for you and if your hands don't work that way, you know, I, I guess maybe I can say the other side, the H, J, K, and L as a very left dominant person wasn't great for me. So maybe that pushed me more towards Emacs, whereas a righty, it works better for that, you know, so that's fine, but it's not inherently better. Um, so anyway, back, back to here. Um, this was the old VI, and that's actually what I'm running here, versus the old Emacs, and that was a real, a legit religious war. And um, it was a legit religious war because they had different philosophies. In Emacs, if you wanted to sort your lines of your file, you know,
you know, you yes, you could, you know, you'll use sort lines. Now, you could use the terminal, but that wasn't the Emacs way. The VI way is use the shell for everything, Unix way. Every program takes input, standard input to standard output, pipe the stuff through. You know, if I want to make this uppercase, I will use the uppercase features built with an Emacs, but if I'm in Vim or VI, I will pipe it through TR. It's a different philosophy. In Emacs, I will have screens and buffers and you know, windows and buffers and all that do everything in here. In Vim, you don't have that. Not in Vim. In VI, you don't have that. VI did not have windows. VI did not have buffers. VI was just you edit a file, you leave. And so what you do is you would have multiple terminals, if you want a graphical system, with multiple VIs. And what we would do later, like in the late 80s, a program came out called Screen. And Screen has been supplanted by Tmux. But Screen would basically let you have multiple terminals in your terminal, so to speak. You know, I have it here just with terminal tabs. But Screen would let you do this if you on an old school terminal. And you could have Windows as well. And you'd load a bunch of VIs in your screens and you'd switch back and forth to them, but each one would be independent. So you'd have these differing philosophies. Small, quick, light, you use it with other tools like screen and the shell, and that's the VI school. And to be honest, the modal thing didn't come up so much. I mean, it's just, you use modal then. Um, versus, you load Emacs in the morning and you use buffers and everything stays within Emacs. Um, but an interesting thing happened. Um, over the years, you know, and th this I realized when I did a dive into VI, which was then Vim in the 90s, you know, over the years things changed. Um, and it changed both for Emacs and for, for Vim or VI. So, for example, in Emacs, you know, you can use the arrows and it works fine because it, people realize, you know, we got to use arrows because that's what people use. Now, I still use previous and next sometimes, but I also use the arrows. And the same thing happened to Vim. So if I'm in, let's go to temp files, so I'm in the same place. And if I do Vim keys.cljs, you know, I can just use my arrow keys here. And it works fine. I'm going to get rid of that, that autosave. Um, because both editor people realize that, oh, you know, we've got to... You know, we're not in the 70s and 80s anymore. We have keyboards with these keys. People are used to them, etc. cetera. Um, you know, but still, it's all historic. It's kind of like an Emacs. It's not cut and paste. It's, you know, whack, yank. You know, those are the words, you know, kill and yank, um, because it predates cut and paste. But that's not really a big deal. You know, once you know it, it's, it's what it is. Um, and in, in, um, in VI, they also use yank. Yank is copy, I guess, because you're yanking it into the copy buffer. I don't know. But it's it's different, but it's so odd. It predates cut and paste. Um, but the interesting thing here is if you're in Vim, and I can like create a file, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and I can come up here and more stuff, and I'll quit out of this. Um, notice how I could use the arrows and move up and down and just do regular editing. But on the other hand, if I go to um, load EX and go into, this is the original VI, I can't go up. You know, and I can't use these control keys because I'm in editing mode. So Vim changed to become more Emacs-like. All right, so Vim decided let's become Emacs by adding that feature, make it more regular. Now, before you jump on me, Emacs has added, you know, even back then, added VI type layers, VI modes. So at the same time, Emacs would be like, let's become Vim, you know, or let's become VI. So this is not a bash of either, but just recognizing that there's something to be said for either sides. I mean, it's the same thing like here with, you know, going into Emacs. So VI, you know, Emacs always had Control X2, Control X3 for Windows, Control X0, and I'm using Ace Window, and I've got another frame that's not being recorded, so that's why... Uh, it's working this way. Um, you know, in VI, when it became Vim, it's like, well, we want Windows too. And so, so Vim, you know, you have the command split, 
and then you could quit the window, but they also have control X, um, I, I wrote it, I have it in my other window, control, ah, didn't want to do that. Let's get out of this mode. Control W S to split, or Control W V for vertically split, and Control W arrow to move. As a you know, it's just different. Is it better? Well, you could say, well, Control W is for window, but you know, Emacs Control X. If I come over to here, come over to my Emacs window. If I do Control X, it has a family of you know, these are your basic functionalities, and so X two, I need two windows. Um, while three, okay, well that now makes, um, that's the other way of splitting, and it's the one after two. There's a logic to it. Um, like if I want to do con uh, rectangular editing, control XR, so control X was our basic get into these mode things. Um, you know, and some of them seem weird, like control X5, two. Is that it? Is it? I think it's control X5, is it that? Yeah, there it is. Control X5, two, and it opened up here a different frame. Let me, let me close the frame. And that doesn't really seem to make sense, but, um, you know, maybe F as in f, uh, 5 begins with F for frame, so it's Control X, then F, 5, F, frame, oh, and then 2, like a window, maybe. I don't, but there was some logic behind it. Um, but it's just different. Uh, but it's not better or worse, but it's really interesting here is that, you know, Vim is becoming Emacs. So now it has a scripting language. Now it has windows. Now it has buffers. Now it has, you know, all of the things that Emacs does, not all of them, but Vim adds those into VI. And even the editing, while it's still modal, is much more non-modal forgiving for basic entry. And again, Emacs is like, we have evil mode. So it's all coming together. Um, so, so really, um, if you look at the history of where we came from, you know, there really, you know, it's, it's no longer much of this, 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 you know, this religious war anymore. I, I just find that really interesting. So another thing that I want to point out here is, um, again, you know, one is not inherently better. So let's go back into, let's go into temp uh, files and we'll load into keys here and let's go into... Uh, Vim keys too. So we're both in keys. And so like one of the things that I hear people talk about for Vim is so awesome is you can do things like um, delete inner and then quotes. And then if I come down here and I hit dot, it does the same thing again. And it's like, oh, wow, that's really cool. It does all, you know, um, you know, and you, you can do these types of primitive operations and build them on each other. And it is cool. Um, so in Emacs, it's a little bit different. So the way I would do it is I use expand region. So I do control plus and notice it's, yeah, this is two keystrokes. But on the other hand, I'm going from mark the word, which is a unit, mark the sentence, mark the quotes, mark inside the parens, mark the, so it's, it's expanding in semantic units. Let me just reload the file and I don't know how to reload the file in Vim, so I'll just come into it that way. So it's just different. Is one better than the other? Um, not objectively, um, but one is probably better for me or for you. So fine, we'll use whichever one you want. Um, you know, another thing that I hear, and you can look at things like that with almost anything, you know, like, you know, this uses, you know, if you want to delete the word, you know, like, you know, come over here, delete word, okay. Uh, whereas I'm over here and, um, you know, Alt-D, okay, big difference. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not a huge difference in the greater scheme of things. So another thing that people talk about is like, well, if I'm in Vim, I can do my lightning fast movement. Um, and it's like, you know, come on, like how lightning fast can you actually be? Um, if you're looking for something on the screen, like I don't want to go ahead, you know, like, like oh, I can go, uh, you know, you know, four forward sentences, you know, or something like that. Um, I don't want to go forward four sentences because my brain can't pick out four sentences away. It, it doesn't work that way. Um, if I want to go four sentences away and I'm in VI right now, like I want to go to that read org that's over here, I'll be look for read, search for read. And if I'm here in Emacs, I'll do the same thing. I'll search for read. Or if I, I don't have this bound to a key, 
I don't think I have it down to a gig because I usually don't use this. I can use AV go to Word, and I can't even see this. Or go no go to character is what I want to do. And I'll be like, go to an R. Let's go. Which one? Let's go to that one. But Vim has the same thing, I've heard. Um, I'll do searching. I, you know, I'll navigate with a facility that uses search. Um, and that's going to be, you know, like, like if it's on the screen, this will get me where I'm going instantly. And I don't have to realize that, oh, I have to go four parentheses away or two paragraphs and three sentences away. And if it's off the screen, I'm going to use search anyway. So again, it's the same deal. Okay, you know, Vim is great for it. Emacs is great for it, um, you know. So, so that's really that, that's really what I'm saying here is they, one will talk to you more than the other, um, but but they're really, in a way, they're kind of coming together, you know. And there are just really a few differences. Um, like I, I said, I've said in the past, and I think I said before, I periodically go into a dive into VI or Vim to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, and um, part of what prompted this video is I'm thinking of doing a dive into evil mode at some point to see if I like that. Um, but but the, one of the times I did this was in the 90s. Um, and the reason I did it is because I read someone's blog post somewhere about this really cool organizational method they used using some Vim plugin. Um, that looked really nice and so I used Vim for like a month or so and it was a cool organizational tool and I don't even remember what it was but Vim didn't do it for me the whole modal thing just didn't do it for me um, so I went back to Emacs and I'm like oh man I can't find anything like that outline mode doesn't do it and then I found org mode which was pretty new at the time and um, you know the rest is history um, and then I was like you know org mode for everything um, but but the, the you know it, it's um you know, that was my impetus to try something. Um, and, but even now, um, apparently there's org mode for Vim in some stage of development. I don't know if it's for Vim or NeoVim or whatever. Um, but, but they're really, you know, the, the, the real interesting thing about this is the choices that, that, that led to Emacs and the choices that led to Vim, you know, they weren't about, you know, like, like, getting the fastest keyboard in the West or, you know, like, like the most ergonomic or, you know, it's history, you know, it's stuff that came from history and over history, they've kind of come a little bit closer um, till that now, as I said, you know, even though Vim is still different, it's kind of co-opted a lot of Emacs features. Um, and then Emacs, you know, didn't really call up Vim features it co-opted Vim, you know, just grabbed the whole evil mode thing and bam. Um, and they both like multiple cursors. Oh, that was sublime text. Let's take it. Um, you know, you know, so, um, what I usually advise my students uh, and, um, you know, and that's, that's the same advice I have here is first off, um, you know, you know, if somebody says these key bindings, be they Vim or be they Emacs or be they like, um, you know, Emacs with the CUA stuff or whatever are better or whatever, objectively better. Just, just don't even bother listening to them. If they say, this is what I like and it works for me, that's great. If they say, oh, I've got this problem, you know, with my wrist or my fingers, and so I use this and it really helps me, yeah, listen to that, that suggestion. Um, but try a few things and don't just try fly by night. You know, give it some time. You know, try, I usually tell my students, spend some time, spend a month or so in Emacs really getting to know it. Spend some time in Vim getting to know it. Spend some time, you know, using Atom or using VS Code. You know, I, I try to push them towards open source stuff. So I, I tell them I, I, I don't like Sublime, um, you know, not because it's a bad editor, just because as far as I know, they've, they haven't agreed. Like if, if Sublime said, if we ever discontinue this product, we will open source it. You know, I'd feel a lot more comfortable about its longevity. Um, but live in it, see what talks to you. Do you like the Emacs way of doing things? Um, you know, do you like the VI way of doing things? Do you like the IDE life of VS Code or whatever? Um, 
you know, and, and then do whatever works for you. So um, I, I hope you, you um, enjoyed this rant and didn't get all pissed off about it. I hope I wasn't, uh, you know, too over the top. I tried to be reasonable about it. Um, I also hope that, um, you know, that, that uh, you know, people think about the history of where these things come from, um, because a lot of things have happened and developed that way. You know, that, like even the typewriter, when they talk about the QWERTY keyboard because of the way the hammers were thrown, um, even though I, you know, I've heard stories that that may not be the case, but but a lot of things were developed for for um, you know not because they were the best, but because the first person who got it to market, who got the market share, the, you know, all sorts of reasons. So anyway, that's all for my rant. This has gone on for way too long. Um, yeah, so that's it. So you know, um, whatever you use, happy coding, and um, you know, I, I hope to see you again at the next video.